Welcome to the Georgia Archives Virtual Lunch and Learn Program. I'm Penny Clef, Education Specialist here at the Georgia Archives. We are glad that you have joined us for our December Lunch and Learn presentation, A History of Christmas Traditions by student historian Andrew Bramlett. 15-year-old Andrew Bramlett is a local historian living in Kennesaw, Georgia. He is vice president of the Kennesaw Historical Society and an honorary member of the Cemetery Preservation Commission for the city of Kennesaw. He volunteers with the Kennesaw Parks and Recreation Department and volunteers at Kennesaw Mountain and National Battlefield Park, where he is a tour guide on the shuttle bus to the top on the weekends. In addition, he is a social media administrator for the Friends of Kennesaw Mountain. In 2018, he won a Georgia Historical Records Advisory Council Award for local history advocacy because of his work on presentations he gives about the history of the city of Kennesaw, Kennesaw Mountain, and his Kennesaw City Cemetery walking tour. Now, if you have friends or family who are unable to view this webinar, they can still enjoy this presentation as it will be uploaded to the Georgia Archives YouTube channel. You may ask Andrew any questions at the end of the presentation. Welcome, Andrew. Well, good afternoon. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. So to start off with, I'd like to talk about the origins of Christmas. Christmas itself began as a Christian holiday, so when the birth of Jesus called the Nativity. However, the exact date of Jesus' birth is unknown, and it's not known why it's now celebrated on December 25th. It is possible that the date of December 25th was chosen because of a Roman festival of Saturnalia, celebrating the god Saturn, that took place in December. Many also believe that Saturnalia influenced later Christmas traditions, most notably gift giving. Now, one of the most iconic traditions is that of Santa Claus. The story begins in 4th century Turkey from a man named Saint Nicholas. He did many good deeds, including giving away all his wealth and helping the sick and poor. In his most famous story, there was a poor man who could not afford a dowry for his daughters. One night, Saint Nicholas dropped a money bag down the chimney and then waited in stockings sitting to hang by the fire. And this, by the way, is why we hang stockings by the fire for Christmas. St. Nicholas became a popular figure and quickly became a part of Christmas. He later became patron saint of children and of sailors. Because he became patron saint of children, parents would give gifts on Christmas to their kids, pretending it was St. Nick. After the Protestant Reformation, saints began to go out of style, so he became known as Father Christmas in England. In Austria and Germany, the position of St. Nicholas also fell by the wayside and was replaced by the infant Jesus being the bearer of gifts. In German, the infant Jesus is called the Christkind, which later became Chris, King, Chris Kringle, which later became a name for Santa himself. One of the few places that St. Nicholas stayed popular was in the Netherlands. The Dutch name for St. Nicholas was Sinterklaas. The Dutch brought that name to America by way of New Amsterdam, now New York. The tradition of Santa Claus later became popular across America, partly due to the works of Washington and Irving. As the tradition grew beyond the Dutch, his name was Americanized to Santa Claus. The modern image of Santa Claus, with his red coat and big white beard, comes from Harvey's weekly cartoonist Thomas Nast. In 1863, he drew a cartoon of his Santa visiting Union soldiers, which is, which is considered the first image of a modern Santa Claus. Nast is also the first to claim that Santa lived at the North Pole. His Santa can be seen right here. Notably, he's not actually wearing a red suit in this image. It's actually an American flag suit. Nast's Santa would have to be inspiration for Coca-Cola Santa advertisements popularizing the image. The original artist of Coca-Cola's Santa advertisements was named Haddon Sonneborn. His neighbor, Will Prentice, was the original model. 
Lou was actually a former uh, salesman. Now, despite his long history, Santa has not always been associated with his eight reindeer. So where did they come from? Unfortunately, it's not known why Santa has reindeer, but what is known is where their names came from. The name is the first coined by Clement Clark Moore in his poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, also called Plus the Night Before Christmas. Dasher, Dancer, and Prancer come from the addition of naming animals after characteristics, while Comet and Cupid are both named after things that fly, like Santa's reindeer. Donnie and Blitzen are both from Dutch. In the original poem, they are called Dondu and Blitzkum, which is Dutch for thunder and lightning. Interestingly enough, at the time, this was a Dutch equivalent of saying good grief. Vixen means female fox. It was chosen because it rhymes with Blitzen. One interesting fact about Santa's reindeer has to do with their antlers. Reindeer are the only species of deer where both genders have antlers. Male reindeer lose their antlers in the fall, while female reindeer keep their antlers through the spring. According to some, this may mean that in order for Santa's eight reindeer to have antlers during Christmas, they may all be, may all be female. Then again, it may just be Santa's magic. Now, of course, I cannot talk about Santa's reindeer without talking about Rudolph. Rudolph first appeared in a 1939 book written by Robert May for the Pirate Store Montgomery Ward. While writing the book, he couldn't choose a name, and he considered Rollo, Romeo, Rodney, and Reginald before finally settling on Rudolph. Rudolph first appeared on TV screens in 1948 in a short film based on the Montgomery Ward book. The film was currently available for the Library of Congress. This that's playing right now on the screen is a bit of an opening credits. I won't show all of them, again, because it is available for free online. But I will show just a small bit with Rudolph himself. And it does have narration, I just didn't include it as I didn't know if, how the sound would work. The full, the full film was about eight minutes long and is roughly similar to what was in the original book. The classic song first appeared one year later in 1959. It was first recorded by Gene Autry. It was written by Robert May's brother-in-law, Johnny Marks, who later in 1958 wrote a sequel, Run Run Rudolph. Even though it was first sung by Gene Autry, the Bill Ives version of 1964 is used much more often due because it was in the um, stop motion film. And finally, with Rudolph's saga, the stop motion film itself came out in 1964. It was produced by Rankin Bass. The tradition of milk and cookies is from the Great Depression. It represented the fact that, even in times of hardship, it's good to give back to those who help us. After the end of the Depression, the tradition continued, as it had already become iconic. Another classic tradition is the Christmas tree. Early Europeans decorated their houses with evergreen trees in the winter, and they were celebrated because they stayed green all year round. In the 1500s, German Christians, hiking back to these earlier traditions, began putting up trees to celebrate Christmas. According to some legends, Martin Luther was the first person to put lights on a Christmas tree. The tradition stayed mostly in Europe, and by the 1700s, Hanaya reached America. German settlers, mostly in Pennsylvania, are the first people to bring Christmas trees to America. That was around the 1740s. However, most Americans do not accept the tradition, as they viewed it as not Christian enough, even until the 1840s, a hundred years later. Over time, it began to be slowly popularized in America. Our first Christmas tree walked from 1851 and was opened by a man named Mike Carr in New York City. Over in England, the story is actually kind of similar. So Oliver Cromwell, who was briefly Wood Protectorate of England, declared that Christmas trees were a part of heathen traditions, and because of this, remained frowned upon for centuries. In 1848, Queen Victoria was shown in the newspapers around a tree with her family, which popularized the tradition in England. It actually came from her husband, Prince Albert, who was German, and brought the tradition with him. 
The artificial Christmas tree was first developed in the 1700s in Germany, and it first made of goose feathers dyed green. The next major development of artificial trees was in 1930, and in that year, a British company named Alice Housewares developed a tree that utilized toilet brush bristles. This pattern of slides from 1911 and some here in the US, but it doesn't represent a major step in artificial tree development. Aluminum trees first came in 1958 and they remained as popular as real trees up until the mid 60s, when all of a sudden they lost all of their popularity. By 1967, they're almost entirely gone. So how did something so popular lose it all? The end came in Christmas of 1965, when a Charlie Brown Christmas aired on TV. The show used the growing Christmas tree as a symbol of commercial Christmas. And this one TV special spelled the end of the entire aluminum tree industry. Another classic tradition is the Yule Log. The first mention of the Yule Log comes from the year 1184 in Germany. There are many theories about what the Yule Log represents. Some think it represents the need for firewood in the winter, while others think it may date back to Celtic rituals of human sacrifice. Regardless of where it came from, the log was not completely burned each Christmas, and whatever was left was used to light another log the next year. According to legend, the mostly burned log was kept inside the house, where it could magically ward off anything from house fires to toothaches. The name Yule itself references the Jewel, J-U-L, or a Norse winter solstice. Of course, we can't talk about the Yule Log without talking about the TV version. The original TV version aired in 1966 by WPIX, a station from New York. It was devised as a way that New Yorkers could, without fireplaces could still enjoy the Yule Log. It was first filmed with Gracie Mansion, the official residence of Mayor of New York. During filming, they actually burned the carpets and were not asked to come back when they had to refilm it later. The original loop was only 17 seconds, it was filmed inside of this fireplace. Unfortunately, I was only able to find an image of the original broadcast and could not find any recordings. There are several versions on YouTube that claim to be a recording of the original, but actually from a late 1970 recording done at California Mansion. That version was due to 1986, when the program was discontinued. It was revived in 2001, there were many parodies and versions of it since then. Advent calendars were first created by German publisher Gerhard Land in 1903. They originally contained Bible verses as small gifts, but eventually the gifts became a primary focus. Another well-known plant symbol of Christmas is a poinsettia. This flower is named native to Central America, and it was first found by the Aztecs, who called it Colorado Ash Ashidol. In 1825, Jubal Roberts Poinsett was appointed United States Ambassador to Mexico. And during one of his trips around the country in 1828, he fell in love with the plant and had them shipped back to a South Carolina plantation. He then began actually growing them and sharing with friends and botanical gardens. And they were named Poinsettias in his honor. He later became a vice president. Now, before we talk about the history of mistletoe, I should mention two quick things about it. First of all, it is in fact poisonous, and second, its name is Old English and means dung on a stick. It was believed that birds would actually poop on sticks and out of little red bulbs were, it was, it was growth that came out of that. As ridiculous as it may sound, we see the same people who believe that, ge that geese used to grow on trees. So given context, it's a bit more rational than that. Now, the tradition of kissing under trees comes from a Norse legend involving Frigg, the goddess of love. In the story, when it was prophesied that Baldi was about to die, Frigg consulted all the plants and animals so it vowed not to kill him. The one plant she did not consult was the lowly mistletoe. Realizing this, the god Loki made a bow out of the plant and fired it at Baldi. Baldi did die, and was later resurrected by the gods. Because of this story, according to legend, Frigg made mistletoe a symbol of love, as a way of saying I'm sorry. Reeds date back to ancient Greece, and were adopted by the Romans, but no one knows what they mean. It's possible that evergreen represents eternal life, as could the circle. 
And Abu Sayyid represents victory, like the royal race won by victorious generals. And so Abu Sayyid represents the crown of thorns won by Jesus at his crucifixion. We truly will probably never know what the wreath actually means. Now the story of a candy cane is more convoluted than you would expect with a stick of solid sugar. The origin story, now famous, is often retold at Christmas time. But the story is not always the same. Some say it take, comes from Indiana, and others say it's Germany in 1670. Version I'm about to share from the Smithsonian Magazine was about writing on the Christmas on the candy cane. Now, according to the story, it was a candy maker. Again, it's not known when and where. We wanted a candy that could be a witness or a symbol of Jesus. So he made the candy cane. He incorporated several symbols from the birth, ministry, and death of Jesus. First, he began with a stick of solid, pure white to hide candy. White to symbolize the virgin birth and the sinless nature of Jesus, and hide to symbolize the solid rock, the foundation of the church. The candy maker made it in the form of a J. Some say to represent the name Jesus, and others say to represent a shepherd's staff, and some say both. Then the candy was somewhat plain. The candy maker stained it with three small red stripes, so the scourging gets received at a crucifixion. There is also a white red stripe, supposedly, for the blood shed by Jesus on the cross. Interestingly, there's no actual evidence of this story, despite how many times it's been shared. According to the Smithsonian, the first hide candy sticks are from the 17th century. The first mention of candy sticks in the United States was in the 1837 Massachusetts Charitable Mechanic Association meeting. The first recipe came in 1844. It had a peppermint flavor and included the stripes. However, they were first called candy canes over 20 years later in 1866. This magazine cover on the right is from Puck Magazine, a popular humor magazine from the Gilded Age. It shows some of the dangers of early infections, including candy canes. Some of the ingredients listed on this candy cane are, let me get out about lazy point to, chrome green is on top, followed by chalk, then red red. After that comes arsenic and chrome yellow and vermilion, followed by arsenic, again, verdigris and glucose. Now, a majority of these substances are colorants. Crumb green on top is a mixture of Prussian blue and crumb yellow paint pigment. It is not recommended that you eat it. Chalk needs no explanation and is also not recommended to be eaten. Red lead is lead oxide, which is both a pigment and is also used in battery manufacturing. Arsenic has not historically been used in candy, but there was one exception in 1858 when an English candy maker accidentally mixed up gypsum and arsenic and accidentally poisoned about 200 people. Chromiol is a paint pigment used in school buses, vermilion is a red pigment, and verdigris is a green pigment of carbon patina. None of this sounds like stuff you'd want to eat. Finally, glucose on the bottom is just sugar. Now, the candy cane also has Georgia connections. In 1919, Robert McCormick of Albany, Georgia, began making candy canes and selling them to area children. His company, now called Bob's Candies, is the world's largest candy cane brand. McCormick's brother-in-law later invented the candy cane making machine in 1957. Gingerbread and gingerbread houses have long been a staple of Christmas. According to legend, it first came to Europe in 992. In that year, a monk named Gregory from Armenia traveled to present-day France and taught people in the area how to make gingerbread. He died about seven years later in the year 999. Now, before moving on with gingerbread, I want to explain this image that's on the slide real quick. This is for the Gingerbread Man, a Broadway musical that Christ made in 1905 and had about 30 performances. The main character is named John Doe, D-O-U-G-H. It is truly a horrible pun. The name was later used by Frank Baum in some of his uh, Wizard of Oz stories. Now, in medieval times, gingerbread became extremely popular in Germany. In fact, it became so popular that a gingerbread guild was established, which graduated gingerbread and the only guild makers could legally make it. In England, gingerbread also grew in popularity. It was with the first of England ordered that gingerbread be made into likenesses of dignitaries whenever they came to visit. And these cookies are the first gingerbread men. Eventually, gingerbread came to America, 
and molasses will play sugar, making a much softer cookie. Gingerbread houses first arose in Germany in the 1700s, and they first came about because of the story of Hansel and Gretel, which is houses made of gingerbread. The world's largest gingerbread man was baked in 2009 in Norway. He weighed 1,435 pounds and was baked by, by the employees of an IKEA. The largest gingerbread house in the world was in two, made in 2013 in Texas. It was 60 feet long, 42 feet wide, and 10 feet tall. It was a fun basic local hospital. You could actually go inside and walk around this gingerbread house. It was just that massive. The ancestor of eggnog is called posset, which is a similar drink made from eggs and figs until about 13th century months. Its modern name is believed to be a mixture of egg and possibly noggin, meaning wood cup, or grog, meaning alcohol. The greatest, it only became a holiday drink in the 1700s in America. Before moving on past Christmas foods, I want to share a food that's not traditionally considered to be Christmassy. Barnum's animal crackers on the top feature of a string, which is meant to be hung on Christmas trees. Actually, recently they actually got rid of the string. There was a big public outcry about it, so I don't know if they're still there anymore. The Christmas card was invented by Sir Henry Cole in 1843. Being a very popular member of Victorian high society, he received many worries over Christmas for Britain's brand new mail service. At the time, it was considered very important to not apply to a wedding, and as more and more Christmas writers flooded in, he needed an answer. He contacted an artist named John Talcott Horsley and had him draw a picture of a family eating Christmas dinner. He had 1,000 copies made and sent them through mail. This became the very first Christmas card. Of course, like all good ideas, it was a mighty stumbling block. One of the younger members of the family is shown enjoying what appears to be an alcoholic beverage. Despite this minor scandal it caused, Christmas cards became very popular and have been enjoyed ever since. Elf on the Shelf is one of the most controversial Christmas traditions. It was created by Carol Abersold and Adati Chanda Bell and Krista Pitts. The book was published in 2004. But what you might not know is that the family is actually from Ackworth, Georgia. Another important part of Christmas is the songs and carols we sing to celebrate the holidays. Good King Wenceslas was written in 1853 by John Mason Neal of England, as was published later in the year. The carols about King Wenceslas traveling the snow of his page. To have a word coming from the 1850s, the tune itself is back to the 13th century. It was called Tempest Addis Floridium, Latin for its time for flowering. So who was King Wenceslas? Wenceslas I, Duke of Bohemia, was born in the year 907 and was now the Czech Republic. When his father, the king, died, a power vacuum was created and Wenceslas' mother ended up getting banished. When all the fighting was done, people decided that Wenceslas should be king. But when he came of age, the king was actually split between him and his brother, Bolslas. They became dukes who co-ruled, so no one was actually king. Wenceslas became a respected leader, earning him the title Wenceslas the Good. Bolswas, who earned the title Bolswas the Cruel, did not like this, and the language of Wenceslas assassinated. On September 28, 953, three nobles killed Wenceslas by stabbing him. Because of how good a ruler he had been as a duke, the Holy Roman Emperor possibly made him a, a king. Why do he was made a saint? Today, according to legend, to a Czech Republic ever be threatened, a statue of Wenceslas in Wenceslas, uh, Went Prague's Wenceslas Square will come alive and win an army to victory. The statue is shown right here. The earliest known printed version of the 12 Days of Christmas dates back to 1780. Some researchers believe that the song is from France and that it was used in games. The games may have involved each person reciting a verse. Then the next person would recite a verse and then add one. Eventually the cycle would go on and on, 
But if someone forgot about those, they'd have to forfeit the game. Some of the song's earliest versions included gifts like Ships Are Sailing and Bears Are Baiting. The version that's used today is actually a perfected version created by Frederick Austin in 1909. The gifts in our current version are a partridge in a pear tree, two turtle doves, three French hens, four calling birds, five gold rings, six geese are laying, seven swans are swimming, eight maids are milking, nine ladies dancing, ten words are weeping, eleven pipers piping, and twelve drummers drumming. Now, in the song, each gift is mentioned every time it's mentioned. For instance, all the gifts on the first day of Christmas are a partridge in a pear tree. On a second day, you gifted another partridge in a pear tree plus two turtle doves. If you count every gift given in the song, there are 364, almost enough for every day of the year. But how much could all of that cost? Each year, PNC Bank creates a Christmas price index. According to the 2020 index, the 12 days of Christmas would cost $179,454.19. If you're curious, the seven swans of swimming are the most expensive gift, costing $13,125 each. And that's also, there's seven of them for each time they're mentioned, and they're mentioned around six times. The most unpredictable gift. If you move the swans entirely from the song and just buy all the other gifts, you end up saving about $150,000. Our next song is Little Drummer Boy. Little Drummer Boy was first written in 1941 by Catherine Davis, a music teacher from Missouri. Originally, the song was called The Kill of a Drum. It was meant to be sung by choirs. According to the original sheet music, it was based on a traditional Czech hymn, but fortunately, it's not known which one she based it on. In fact, she just voted herself. The song was first recorded in 1951 for Trap Family Singers, The Sound of Music Thing. When they recorded the song, it was still called The Kill of the Drum. It quickly became a hit in America. In 1968, it found its own TV special produced by Bank and Bass. Jingle Bells was first published in 1857. And the original lyrics by James Pierpont are a bit longer than today's version. And the rest of the song, a person singing recalls how they went on a sleigh ride with a girl, the sleigh turned over, and soon another man rides up and laughs at the two of them. Additionally, the song originally went, bells and a bobtail ring, making the spirits bright. Oh, what sport to ride and sing a swaying song tonight. And the chorus also mentioned what joy it is to ride instead of what fun. James Pierpont, who wrote the song, actually lived in Georgia. He was a music teacher at the Savannah Unitarian Church, and served in the 5th Georgia Cavalry during the Civil War. Afterward, he worked in Valdosta and Quitman. He passed away in Florida, but is buried in Savannah. White Christmas, written by Irving Berlin in 1942, was first recorded by Bing Crosby. The song quickly became a hit, and Crosby's version is the world's best-selling single record of all time, selling over 50 million copies. The runner-up, which is Candle on the Wind, has only sold 33 million. However, I should mention that neither of these statistics include digital sales. The Nutcracker was music by Tchaikovsky, premiered on December 18, 1892, in St. Petersburg. The original story was a book written by E.T.A. Hoffman and was very dry compared to today's story. Hoffman's story was later adapted by Alexandre Dumas, author of the Count of Monte Cristo with Three Musketeers. It is Dumas' version that the ballet is based on. It was also originally performed mostly by children instead of adults. Now my next few stories are all about classic Christmas books. The book shown on the slide here is Old Christmas by Washington Irving. Irving was very important in popularizing Santa Claus in America, but not actually through this book. Instead, Santa Claus is mentioned in his book, The Picture of New York. Plus, The Night Before Christmas, which is actually titled A Visit from St. Nicholas, was published in 1823 anonymously. The original version contains several differences compared to modern versions. Most notably, Santa says, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. 
1937, 14 years after its publication, Kermit Clark Moore revealed himself to be the true author of a classic poem, but not everyone is convinced he's the actual author. The winning alternative is Henry Grivingston Jr., a poet and farmer, but it may likely never be resolved. I believe the most recognizable Christmas book is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Dickens came up with a story in 1843 after giving a presentation for Benjamin Dez Once it was published in Christmas of 1843, it took a full three days to sell out. He gave public readings, which not only very powerful due to ticket sales, but also helped spread the word about his book. According to one account, Dickens made sure to keep his food unique on days he read aloud to audiences. Breakfast was rum mixed with cream. At tea time, he'd have champagne, and before reading, he'd have, he would drink sherry mixed with a raw egg. During readings, he had a cup of beef tea with him at all times. It's not known how Ebenezer Scrooge got his name. Ebenezer is a biblical name meaning stone of help. And Scrooge possibly comes from the word scrooging, meaning squeezing. Charles Dickens described Scrooge in the book as a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. This, of course, leads to another fact about Charles Dickens. While many have joked he passed his life as a proof he was paid by the word, he was in fact paid by the installment for each chapter. It's not known how Fidel Giesel, better known as Dr. Seuss, came up with the name The Grinch, but he always used it to mean mean characters. Seuss first used the name in his 1953 book, Scrambled Egg Supper. The Grinch, in his most famous form, appeared in the 1957 book, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. According to Giesel, he based the holiday hating character on himself. Additionally, the Grinch is black and white in the book, opposed to his iconic green. According to Legend, the animator of the TV special was inspired by a hideous rental card he had when he made the Grinch green, but it's not known if it's actually any truth to the story. Of course, there are many classic Christmas movies. While I won't be able to cover everything, I hope you at least provide some highlights. The very first Christmas film was titled Santa Claus, and was released in the UK in 1898. The one minute film was a technical marvel at the time. The film has been preserved. I'll be able to show the full thing. There's no sound of it, of course. It's not working. Sorry about that. It, um, it is available uh, on YouTube for British Film Institute. They have a copy. Sorry about that. <laughs> the 1946 film It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jane Stewart, is an undeniable classic. The film was based on the story of the greatest gift. It was not universally liked when it came out. In fact, it lost half a million dollars at the box office. The film's copyright expired in 1974, and it began to be shown on TV simply because it was cheap. Because of this, it was shown many times, and ended up becoming a Christmas classic. Interestingly, because the story it's based on is still in copyright, the film is now considered to be in copyright. Miracle on 34th Street is about Macy's Santa, from Thanksgiving Day Parade to Christmas Day. Edwin Gwen, who played Santa in the film, also portrayed Santa in real life of a 1946 parade. They had to do this because they couldn't film at any other time. While it may seem a wholesome movie, at the time a group called the Legion of Decency gave it only a B rating, because Marina Hur's character was divorced. B at the time meant tightly objectionable. Strangely, this classic Christmas film was released in May to attract the summer crowds. They actually had to hide it in the marketing that it was about Santa. The 1954 film White Christmas was based on the earlier Irving Berlin song. 
it already become a number one hit. The song previously killed the film Holiday Inn, but proved so popular, it decided an entire film should be based around it. Despite being based on a song famously recorded by Ben Crosby, Crosby almost decided not to sign the film. He ultimately chose to appear, and the film ended up becoming the highest grossing movie of 1954. While well, I've talked about classic films we all love, it's time to mention a not-so-classic movie. Santa Claus Conquers the Martians was released in 1964, and its title gives away its entire plot. It is famously horrible. I'm not sure I want to admit this, I have personally seen it, and I can attest to how bad it is. I will also say that this still of a film is one of the better looking parts, which does not say much. On IMDb, it has a 2.7 out of 10, putting the bottom 100, and a 22% score on Rotten Tomatoes. Highlights of reviews include Incompetent, Ineptitude, No Warmth, one of the single worst films ever made, as obvious and as square cut as cheese. The sick one reviewer compared it to the delayed artificial rhythm of a transatlantic phone call. Someone else called it a car accident unfolding before your eyes. One of my personal favorites is where someone said it was about as heartwarming as a documentary about reconstructive bowel surgery. Finally, finally uh, one reviewer also said that its part was so obvious it was an insult to the intelligence of a two-year-old. It is truly horrible. A Charlie Brown Christmas premiered on December 9, 1965, and as mentioned earlier, it killed the Ronan tree industry. The entire special had a budget of $76,000 and was supposed to have a laugh track. The jazz score was one of the most iconic parts of the special, but Charles Schultz, creating the Peanuts characters, famously thought jazz was, and I quote here, awful. By the time the special was completed, it was shown to CBS executives who hated it. It did finally air, and when it did, 50% of all viewers on TV watched the special. It's remained iconic ever since. Today we have quite plenty of classic traditions, but there are also many that we have lost. One of my favorites is Snapdragon. Snapdragon was a commonly played in Victorian England on Christmas Eve. A large, shallow bowl was placed on the middle of a table and 24 raisins were put inside, and then a full bottle of brandy was dumped in. Once ready to play the game, you light the brandy on fire. Once your whole family, children included, is huddled around this strange concoction, everyone takes a turn reaching in and trying to grab a raisin. If you're successful, you must put it in your mouth to extinguish it and then eat it. It remained a classic Christmas tradition for many years, unfortunately, before falling out of favor. On a side note, there was a non-Christmas version that was also played called Flap Dragon. In Flap Dragon, you take a mug, you put inside a wet candle and a bunch of alcohol, and try to drink the alcohol without burning yourself. Wassail is a medieval English drink, usually made of a variety of alcohol, cider, and baked apples. It's typically drunk during Dual Tide at Twelfth Night. Dual Tide is an early form of Christmas, and Twelfth Night is the final day of the Twelve Days of Christmas, hence the name. Wassail was usually drunk to signal the hope of a good apple harvest. I should note also that Shakespeare's Twelfth Night is actually, of course, not Christmassy, and it's not known why it's called that as there's no known connection between it and the Twelfth Night celebrations. The Lord of Misrule was the medieval official in charge of all Christmas festivities, particularly in England. In Scotland, he was called the Abbot of Misrule. The Lord of Misrule was actually a peasant, and was often served a parody of nobility. It is possible the Lord of Misrule tradition dates back to Saturnalia, the Roman festival honoring Saturn mentioned at the start of my presentation. The title, Lord of Misrule, was also used as an insult. This cartoon shows Wellington, of Waterloo fame, depicted as the Lord of Misrule. Thomas Morton, founder of the colony of Marymount, in what's now Massachusetts, was referred to by the pilgrims as the Lord of Misrule as well. 
since at least the Tudors. It was destined to tell ghost stories well into the night in England. It never caught on in America, largely because the pilgrims and Puritans disliked the supernatural elements of ghosts. These ghost stories, why a Christmas Carol, a classic Christmas story, heavily features ghosts. By the turn of the century, people were beginning to feel that Christmas ghost stories were losing their dignity, and the practice fell out of favor. Many events, though not directly related to Christmas, have taken place on Christmas Day throughout the centuries. One of the first to be the coronation of Charlemagne and St. Peter's Basilica on December 25th, 800. I've not found anything that explains why it took place on Christmas Day, or it was just have to be a coincidence. Charlemagne's coronation as leader of the Carolingian Empire marked the site of the Holy Roman Empire as well. 266 years later, William the Conqueror was crowned King of England inside Westminster Abbey. Several months earlier, William defeated the previous English king, Harold, at the Battle of Hastings. William's French influence on England would drastically affect English society. Like Charlemagne's coronation, it is unclear if there was any significance to events taking place on Christmas Day. In 1492, the Santa Maria reached the bottom of the ocean blue. On December 25th, 1492, the Santa Maria ran aground. Columbus ordered her wood to be removed to build a fort named La Navidad after the day she wrecked. On December 25th, 1776, George Washington crossed the Delaware River to attack the Hessians at Trenton. The victory of the resulting Battle of Trenton helped to inspire many to join the Continental Army. Crossing Christmas Day was a coincidence. Now, this painting that's on the screen is a famous image of that event by Emmanuel Woods, but shows it. However, this is not the original. Woods was actually a German artist, and his original was shipped back to Berlin, as well as just during a bombing raid in World War II. This one, that's one commonly reproduced today, is a Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's a way to copy, but still by Woods. Additionally, many well-known people have Christmas birthdays. Isaac Newton was born at Christmas Day of 1642. Claire Barton was born December 25th of 1821. Louis Chevrolet, the founder of Chevrolet, was born December 25th of 1878. And Humphrey Bogart was born December 25th of 1899. Christmas has also been celebrated in Georgia since before we were a state. The first newspaper mention of Christmas in Georgia is in the November 18, 1767 edition of the Georgia Gazette. The reference to Christmas is inside an ad asking for information about a horse stolen around the Christmas of 1766. It's a very anticlimactic first mention. The Christmas tree house sits in Elberton. It was built in 1848 by German cabinet maker George Lowell. The Gower family put up a Christmas tree after the birth of their first child, and it's believed that this tree was the first in Georgia history. Using his skills as a cabinet maker, Gower handcraft wooden tools to place under the tree each year. The family sold the house in 1875. The story of that first tree has given the house its name. Bridges Department Store was founded by Morris Ridge in 1867. The store quickly grew into one of the ranch's largest businesses, and many still have fond memories of ranches. Many of these memories are of Rich's Christmas celebrations. Starting in 1848, 1948, my bad, a large 75 foot tree was placed on top of Rich's store. The lighting of the tree on Thanksgiving marked the start of the ranch's holiday season. Five years later, the soul of the pink pig was added to festivities. The children's ride first standing out of the toy department was later moved to the tree. The downtown store closed in 1991. The soul was moved to Eggleton's Children's Hospital, a lot of donated to the Atlanta History Center. An updated version of the soul ran at Wedding Square Mall from 2003, but sadly, 2021 will be the soul's last year running. It will be sorely missed by many people. Similar to the major national events covered a few moments ago, 
George has had some notable events happen on Christmas Day as well. The most famous Georgia Christmas event took place opting whites to the sea. Savannah fell to the Union Army on December 22, 1864, and General Sherman took over president, saying he had, as a Christmas gift, the city of Savannah with 150 heavy guns and plenty of ammunition, and also about 25,000 barrels of cotton. Even though the fall of Savannah did not take place on December 25th, because of this telegram, it still has strong connections to Christmas. Governor John M. Stoughton is our only governor born on December 25th. He was born December 25th of 1866 in Mayweather County, which is near Warm Springs. He famously played with William Frank, which ended his, ended his political career. Finally, it was on December 25th, 1929, the Fox Theater opened in Atlanta. The famed Movie Palace remains one of Atlanta's most iconic buildings. Before moving past Georgia Christmas, I want to share several Im images from Vanishing Georgia collection here at the Georgia Archives. This first image was a fam family Christmas, but the image has no date or location. This image was taken in 1902 and shows people celebrating Christmas in front of a church. This 1922 image shows William Perrin Nicholson III of Atlanta. Nicholson lived at lived possibly at the William P. Nicholson House, built in 1891 after the name of National Register of Historic Places. This 1938 photo shows Christmas decorations at the Grange Square. This 1927 image is from Conyers and shows a crowd waiting for Santa to arrive at their depot. This final image shows Calvin Coolidge himself planting a tree on Georgia's Sea Island. Coolidge visited Georgia for Christmas in 1928. Though his photo was not taken exactly on Christmas, it still does show quite of that holiday trip. Of course, many countries have their own Christmas traditions, but are not commonly found here in America. The Christmas pickle is a classic example. Supposedly, German, Germans place pickle Christmas ornaments in trees, and whoever finds pickle first either receives an extra present or a year of good fortune. Interestingly, most Germans have never heard of a Christmas pickle, much less used one. There are several stories about its actual origin, but all of them take place in America. Most notably, it may have been an advertising ploy by Woolworths to sell more grass Christmas ornaments that shakes fruits and vegetables. Some feel that the um, pickle or cucumber shaped ornament was not selling particularly well. I had to find a way to get rid of them, and this is what they came up with. Others have this big, long, elaborate story about this German soldier who fought in the Civil War and ended up being a prisoner of war, and the sustenance of a pickle is the only thing that saves him from starvation. But it's a very long and convoluted story, and it, it sounds too good to be true. <laughs> Christmas pudding, also called pump pudding, is very common in the UK. There are many legends and myths around Christmas pudding, including that it should be made with 13 ingredients, one for Jesus, 12 for his apostles. It is also strongly associated with George the First, who supposedly first made it a Christmas tradition. There is also a tradition of baking a coin into the cake, and whoever finds it will have good luck. Other tokens are sometimes hidden inside, including a button for bachelors, a thimble for old maids, and a ring for marriage. In addition to food-related traditions, there are also Christmas creatures. In Austria and parts of Germany, the Krampus is an important part of the Christmas season. He is celebrated, or more accurately, feared, on December 5th. The Krampus gives, will give bundles of sticks to bad children, though old traditions say he beats children with the sticks. Obviously, he also brings bad children to hell inside his big sack. Either way, the campus is not as nice as his jolly friend Santa, who also is like a yin and yang almost. Iceland has the Jolakaturin, or the Yule Cat. As pleasant as that sounds, the Yule Cat encourages children to do their chores, 
and raising children are often threatened with being sacrificed for your cat. Bill Snickle, who visits children before Christmas and avoids them with candy, originated in Germany, but was traditionally to stay only found on the Pennsylvania Dutch. Bell Snickle also asks as a warning for bad children to clean up their act before Christmas. In Italy, instead of Santa delivering presents, the task is a realm of La Bafana, an old woman who rides a broom. Like Santa, she enters using the chimney and often leaves coal for bad children. Instead of visiting on Christmas, she visits on the Feast of the Epiphany, January 5th. She also invites a broom like a witch. Some traditions have emerged only in recent years. A great example of this comes from Sweden, where it's used to watch a Disney Christmas special. The special closed in 1958 and is called From Us to All of You. Since 1959, it's aired on Swedish public TV on December 3rd at December 24th. There have been several efforts to change the day and the time, but Swedes keep pushing back against it. The special is filled with segments from various, various Disney films, uh, but very few of them are actually Christmassy. Each year, around 40% of all of Sweden stops whatever they're doing and tunes us into watching it. The lowest viewership ever was 36%, most was, I believe, around uh, like 55. Even though Donald Duck is only in one segment, the special is strongly associated with him because he is actually more popular in Sweden than Mickey Mouse. Continuing with another real story that sounds almost too difficult to believe, we must travel to Japan. In the 1960s and 70s, many American fast food restaurants were opening locations in Japan, including Kentucky Fried Chicken. Christmas has not been in Japan for very long, so Japanese have very few Christmas traditions. There are two versions about how KFC came into Japanese Christmas. In one, KFC falsely claimed they were a Christmas staple in America and never to sell more fried chicken. In the other version, the manager of a KFC in Japan wore a Santa outfit, realized the children loved it, and saw a marketing opportunity. However it happened, KFC had began showing American families join KFC for Christmas, and the Japanese soon made it a tradition. According to a 2020 article, KFC made $63 million in Japan and just for five days before Christmas. So clearly it worked, however it came about. The Christmas cracker comes from England. In the 1840s, London baker Tom Smith visited Paris and found bonbons wrapped in tissue paper. One day, he had the boring crackling of a fire and had an idea and his new invention became the Christmas Cracker. As you can see here, Christmas crackers are shaped similar to bonbons. The middle monkey is holding one. Uh, later, it became very popular for Christmas crackers to have decorative boxes. They became correctable like baseball cards. That's why they're so elaborate and sometimes weird. This fentanyl Santa subway also shows the shape. All a person has to do the magic of a Christmas cracker to work is pull at the ends. It creates a small explosion. Real Christmas crackers are nowhere near as large as what's shown here, and can actually be held in one hand. Regardless, this illustration gives you an idea of a process. The explosion is created by strips of paper. One is still with fulminate, and the other which has been described as an abrasive material. When the two rub together, an explosion is created. This image here also shows sort of a process at work. Inside is a paper hat, a toy, and a corny joke. Now, I worked up and I pulled a few Christmas cracker corny jokes. Uh, because this is virtual, the comedic timing may not work, but I hope you still enjoy them. Now, what does Santa suffer from if you get stuck in a chimney? Claustrophobia. What kill is heard in the desert? O oh, camel ye faithful. What do you call a boomerang that does not come back? A stick. Why couldn't the skeleton go to the Christmas party? He had no body to go with. And finally, my favorite, what happened to a man that stole an advent calendar? He got 25 days. The marketing poised religious traditions and corny jokes 
I hope you've enjoyed learning more about our Christmas traditions. Are there any questions? Um, we have a comment here. I am very much enjoying the presentation. Many thanks, Andrew. Um, and an entertaining and informative lunch and learn. And you have this one. Um, question Do you have any favorite Christmas tradition songs or movies? Movies. Oh, uh, songs and movies. I want to like white Christmas, that's why I put it in this presentation, both the song and the movie. Um, of like Christmas movies to but I'm based on songs. That is actually a very good question. Um, oh yes, that is my yes. Okay, that's definitely it. Christmas vacation. I can't believe I didn't think of that. Yeah. Okay. In your research, did you find something that really surprised you? A lot of stuff. Um, big one is Snapdragon, the Victorian game with the raisins. That just sounds like a complete bad idea. I don't know how it ever came about. Um, that being said, now that I know it exists, I would like to play it, but <laughs> I don't think that's happening anytime soon. <laughs> I don't see any other questions right now. Um, how long did it take you to research this? Well, if you go strictly by total long time, uh, two years. Uh, that's because I created a 30 minute version of this a couple years ago, and that's what some of this is. And the rest was actually created um, this year, so I could give a long presentation here. Um, in terms of actual time researching, though, I, I don't know offhand. <laughs> Uh, you have a comment. Uh, great info. Thanks. Thank you. Um, somebody is typing in a question right now. It's just taking a little bit while. Oh, interesting. Has your family created a new tradition that you practice? With Christmas, our big thing is we have a checklist of Christmas each things to do. It'll be like watch like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or make peppermint bark. Um, this year, watch Die Hard is on the list. Um, that really is the big one, big Christmas one for us. Um, also, thanks to Penny, we now have Christmas crackers, which has become a tradition as well. Sure. Yes. Um, here's one of them. I won't exploit it since we'll save them for Christmas. But yeah, it's definitely quite fun, and the jokes are very corny. <laughs> Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Everybody's saying thank you. Thank, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Hope, hope you enjoyed it. Andrew, thank you. That was that was awesome. That thank was you. a great presentation. Um, I know we all learned a lot. Um, I would pass on the Christmas game, Snapdragon. They lit it on fire and told their kids to go in there. Is that, that what Absolutely. happened? Absolutely. Of course, it's technically safe. <laughs> it's amazing that we no longer have that. You know, we talk about infant mortality rates and this getting dope, um, in terms of like disease and stuff like that. But really, there were a lot of other causes. Christmas might have been one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was great. Um, but, 2022, we already have a full list of Lunch and Learn and Fourth Friday from the Archives presentations. Um, on January the 14th, our Lunch and Learn presentation is Future Places Project, Redefining Historic Preservation in Atlanta by Doug Young, Assistant Director, Office of Design, Historic Preservation Studio. Just look for the link on our webpage, www.georgiaarchives.org. And we're really glad that you joined us and we will see you next time. Bye. <coughs>